Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. It's George the Antique Nomad at The Antique Nomad on Periscope, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as rebroadcasting on YouTube. It's great to have you with us again. I am at the Collector's Carnival. This is in Evansville, actually Princeton, Indiana, north of Evansville. And it is a big show that happens four times a year. And they draw dealers all the way from St. Louis to, um, gosh, I think Nashville. There's quite a number of dealers here inside. And so we'll uh, pan around and show you. Um, the first space that uh, we see here has a lot of holiday-related Halloween cards, uh, some really cool old sporting, this picture with the football player, unusual. That's going to be from the early 1900s when they start wearing pads. Football was very dangerous back then, and they almost made it illegal. But then they uh, decided that they could pad everybody up, and we're still going through some of those problems now. The turtle here is interesting because this is a Ken Edwards style. This is Mexican pottery from the late 1960s. You'll see several other pieces here. Ken Edwards was an American who went down into Mexico to the Tonala play area, and uh, the Jimon family became very involved as well. And you can see here they have good information on this. Florentino Jimon Barba is currently heading the family workshop, and so apparently they are still producing pieces like this there today. Sterling is a local beer here, and so you will see Sterling items in more abundance than we would see them in other parts of the country. This old graphic here from the 50s is pretty cool. And then we've got the Ertl's 92 beer here. I think I will come back and buy those. Those seem like a good price or something from the 60s with pinup girls. Whole bunch of beer cans here, all sorts of different varieties. These are the metal type that are from the 1950s and 60s. You see the Schmidt beer here. Schmidt was all over the place with animals. We always called it animal beer when I was in college because every can had an animal on it. Sterling here looks like this, and then we've got Fall City and Ertl, which are also locals. And then over here, head vases. This is a really good collection of head vases. There are a whole lot of different varieties, and we see a lot here that are Japanese from the late 50s and early 60s. The real craze for these started right after the Second World War. Carmen Miranda became very famous. She was the dancer who would dancer and singer who would wear fruit and vegetables on her head as a big headdress and they made head bases of her because of that and that kicked off the whole fad. Lucille Ball was immortalized on one as well as uh, Jackie Onassis. Uh, the celebrity ones are very hard to find but even these gals, um, you'll, speaking of celebrities back here, this one was based on Lana Turner and it even has the drawn in eyebrows. She was in some movie and they had her shape her eyebrows and they never grew back, so that became her trademark. This is a hard piece to find by F and F Plastics. It is the large Aunt Jemima and she is the cookie jar. They didn't make many of those. You see more of the salt and pepper shakers. Aunt Jemima recently redid their um, branding to remove the mammy look that Aunt Jemima had, but Aunt Jemima was in fact a real person and that was the way that she looked. Um, she became very famous at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair making pancakes and that's what made her a celebrity. And she came from absolute nothing to become quite a celebrity in her time. These are some nice carved Bakelite clips. These are going to be 1930s and 40s. You see some good colors there and then here's a really cool collection of shoe pin cushions. These are yeah, so Victorian era, it appears. And they are really neat. I haven't seen so many in one place before. This dealer also has uh, some very nice handmade clothing, crocheted pieces, baby pieces, and then something up here we don't see often. This is a Victorian match holder, and it says it's got a striker. So if we look at the bottom, 
or underneath, we're going to see some rough spot. There it is. That's where they would strike the matches. And then they'd keep them inside the box. And that was a big deal because matches couldn't get wet back then. Now we've got the ones that can handle the moisture, but back then not so much. I'm going to want to come back here and take a look at these pieces. They're wood and I see even lucite, the pair of scissors. And the interesting thing to me with those is that they are 1940s era. That's when we couldn't get crystals from Austria because we were at war. That's also why Bakelite became very popular. And there's some really neat... Um, uh, these are bad, uh, Brad Eltring, and those are uh, later pieces that are uh, put together, but then there's some earlier pieces in here. The cross is a Stanhope. If you see that little hole in it, that little black spot, that is actually a lens. And if you were to look through that, you would see the Lord's Prayer. Um, sometimes you see other things as well. Uh, they did ones for that were nudies and naughties as well as ones that were religious. So kind of an interesting combination. Here's the John Deere tractor. I did a picture of one of these on my daily post recently, and it's got the very hard to find little wagon that trails behind it. That's worth as much as the pedal car itself. Gonna head around the corner here. We have a lot of people bringing out fall decor type items because it is the season. And we also see farm primitives and decorator items. This wooden spoked wagon wheel from about 1910 is a neat looking piece. They also, because we're in the part of the country where it came from, have hull pottery. And in this case, they have a number of the hull corky pigs. This came out and is dated generally, there we go, I think we can see it, 1957 corky pig hull USA patent pending. They did end up getting a patent on it, and they made them in the pinks, the yellows, and the browns, and the blues. They also made a big razorback pig. How much? Uh, it appears the prices on these are in the $65, $75 range, which is kind of typical of the time uh, of these pieces. And there is a yellow version that's a little harder to find and a little more money. The whole pieces were made in the 1950s in the brighter colors and the 1960s in the uh, uh, brown colors. And then the whole pottery itself was um, made in the 1940s in the pinks. And then we see a lot of um, farm primitives here. We're going to go down the aisle and see what else we've got. This space has a lot of things we associate with the Midwest. I see everything from antique wooden cabinets and books to a big shelf full of candy containers. These were things that uh, were made for children back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. They had little pellet candies in them, and then you save the jar, and the jars have become rather collectible. The pieces here, the little tavern candles, are going to be 1950s and 60s, as well as the really groovy polka dot pitcher here. Then I'm going to come back and show uh, these folks have a nice uh, display of Vintage Christmas items. I see the Holt Howard chocolate set from the 1950s. They really are not technically antiques. Antique has to be a hundred years old or more, but if something is 30 years old or more, it falls into the collectible or vintage category. Um, so they're going to be vintage collectibles, not currently available, but not old enough to be true antiques. This piece here, however, may be old enough to be a true antique. This is Ool Pottery out of Evansville very popular here. And if you pull back, the piece is actually a butter churn, and it's got the original lid. That's a hard thing to find. Next to it, we have an interesting wave crest piece. This is a wave crest humidor. This is a cigar humidor. We usually see dresser boxes and that sort of thing. So this is an unusual piece, and it does have the mark on the bottom. Not all wave crest is marked. It's hard to read, but if you could see in that little pink cartouche, it actually does say wave crest. Antiques are a hundred years old or more. The only exception to that are cars. Cars are considered antique at age 50, and that does create a lot of confusion because you hear antique car, and it's not the same as antique, what we think of in antiques in other ways. It's just the way they're defined. This is a hard to find piece. This is H.A. Ogden. This was men in uniform, World War I. So you see uh, various uniforms, officers and doughboys. Uh, and actually this says it is right before World War I, but it would have been the same uh, type of khaki service and fatigues. 
And these are showing Brigadier Generals, field staff, line officers, and enlisted men. So it's a very good catalog of what the U.S. Army was dressed like heading into the First World War. This cabinet here with the 20 compartments, I think, is rather a neat idea because it's an old store display, but the cabinets make it really functional at home in a way that an empty case might not be. You've got lots of places to sort and put things. To say the thing to buy that will go up in value is something that you like and will keep for a long time because the antique market some things go up some things go down it has a lot to do with generations so if you're trying to figure out what to buy for the future look for things that millennials will want in 10 or 20 years look for things that generation x people want now uh, people who grew up in the 70s 60s 70s 80s are looking for things from their childhood as nostalgia those are things that if they haven't already shot up in value are more likely to increase in value than a lot of true antiques because true antiques are actually kind of discovered. People know what they are, they're well chronicled, and there's a pretty good idea of the markets. Obviously, the more rare and unusual in any category, the more desirable it will be. Speaking of things that appeal to collectors coming up today, we see a set of the Crazy Daisy Pyrex bowls from about 1970. All this glassware, kitchen glassware from the 1960s and 70s and back into the 50s with the jadeite that we're going to show you here. All of this is very popular and it's popular all over the place. A lot of it is uh, most collected here in the United States, but actually the Japanese love the jadeite. A lot of it was sent over there in the 1950s. Uh, Europeans recognize some of the American pieces as well, so there's a lot of interest in that now. These are lacquer Russian boxes, and each one depicts something generally from some sort of a fairy tale or some sort of a book written in Russia, and there are great books chronicling all of these. They're very nicely done. They're generally signed with the name of the town as well as the name of the maker. The little piece here, the needle case on the right, sewing implements are very collectible. Um, that's a good example of that. There's also a nice Iroquois whimsy. Buttons, very collectible. This dealer has a nice selection of metal buttons, birds and urns, um, fancy metal buckles, portrait buttons. A lot of different kinds of buttons from the Victorian era are very collectible. And then these are tatting shuttles, all in sterling. And those are kind of an unusual piece. And then they have some nice jewelry pieces here. I particularly am fond of Czech jewelry from the 1920s, so I want to show off this really nice green enamel bracelet with the stones. It's costume jewelry, but it's very collectible now. And they also have a bunch of chenille Santas. These were done generally right after the Second World War. The face is a little bit of uh, porcelain bisque, and then they'd use essentially similar to pipe cleaners to make them all. And then we've got some carved Bakelite and celluloid bangles, a really nice selection here as well. Those are cool. Yeah, they're pretty. I, I, the colors are interesting and they're fun. And they're fun to wear. And also a couple of child sewing machines. The one on the right is a K&E Sewmaster from Germany from the late 40s, early 50s. The one on the left with its box is Singer. A singer for the girls teaches them to make clothes for their dolls. As the twig is bent, the trees incline. So basically, teach them to sh sew young because they're going to have to know how. That was the theory back then, and it was probably true at the time. These days, I have to say a lot of people, myself included, cannot even sew a button. This space has a good Bakelite telephone here. This space has a lot of, I guess you would say, guy stuff for lack of a better word, but that's kind of an unfair characterization because a lot of women like these things these days too. But a lot of things that are farm items, farm finds. Um, this is an old tire iron from the 1920s or 30s. There's an old needle rack here. A lot of people uh, like old signage. You've got fire hose and the emergency escapeway, which hopefully are the same direction, not opposite. There's Turquoise stones, there's various other um, sterling and natural stones in these pieces. The pieces down at the bottom here are Scottish, 
and you'll see amber and other uh, heather stone and that sort of thing in them. How are you doing? Fine. How are you? And then this is a wonderful case of amber here. Yeah, that is really neat, actually. And um, yes, she has some really lovely amber and sterling pieces. These are owls. These are being done for um, out of Baltic amber and sterling. And a lot of these other pieces, you'll see some inclusions and that sort of thing. And you'll see carved pieces as well, which are kind of hard to find. Amber is very hard, so it's difficult to find. And then this is a nice display of coral, and I really am personally very fond of the bear claw jewelry. So right there, the third one down, you'll see the bear claws. These are really neat concho belts, and hard to find, and hard to find in these sizes. These pieces here are oyster plates, and these are interesting. This one made into a, a triple trivet in the middle, but then these are Haviland Limoges from the turn of the last century. Oysters were a really big deal because until the 1880s when the refrigerated boxcar made its appearance, before Westinghouse invented that, you could not get cold things into the interior. So oysters were something you only could get fresh at the beach until then. And it became quite a status symbol to be able to buy oysters and to have plates for them. Uh, oyster plates typically these days run in the 85 to $125 range. And then there's a bunch of Waterford crystal here, very collectible, and a lot of people are still pattern matching these patterns. I'll turn to the back here. And then um, these are Majolica pieces. The one on the right is interesting because it's a more squarish Art Nouveau design. And then we have the English dogwood in the middle. And the one on the left is fan and scroll. That's also an English piece. The French tended towards flowers, and the English did some of that, but they did other designs as well. These pieces are compare, and it came with the yellow or the buff background. These were all hand-painted in the French folk tradition. Henri Compare is one of the main, main makers, and that factory made this very interesting swan egg platter in the front. That has some age and is a form that I've never actually seen in person before. Usually we see pitchers and plates and those sorts of items. There is a very dramatic face, I would say. With the horns and everything, I suppose that he is supposed to be a horned beast of some sort. He's definitely Art Nouveau style. You have irises on the back. This is a German Kaiser Zinn piece. I don't know that it's marked in any way. It is marked on the bottom. It'll be hard to see, but you probably saw a little bit of an embossing there. Krampus. Just uh, Yes, it does look like Krampus, I agree. Perfect for Christmas. And then we'll take a look at this dental cabinet. This is dated 1925. It's got a lot of drawers with uh, various um, sectioning, and it also has this opening here with the slide out uh, piece. A lot of people are interested in dental cabinets because they're a good way to house collections of anything from jewelry to shells. A bunch of early notebooks and memoranda. We usually see these sell in about a $5 range and that is in fact what they're looking for here. This is a neat piece because it's an old oil and gas back when service stations actually were service stations and they came and pumped the gas and took care of it for you. They would be, the attendants would wear caps like this. And this piece does not actually have a price on it. They usually sell for $25 to $30 these days. Um, I find things in Indiana to be more plentiful and less expensive in certain lines than certain places, but I have to be honest. You really can find deals everywhere, and you can see things priced at full retail everywhere because it just depends on what part of the market people are working in. Sometimes it depends how they got the piece. Sometimes if a dealer gets a whole lot of something at once, they'll make it less expensive uh, because they want to sell volume. These pieces are carnival glass here, and you'll see various patterns. These are 1910s era, original carnival glass. 
and Indiana definitely less expensive than New York City, although I have found great things in New York City for cheap. I have a pair of sunglasses I'll have to show you someday that I refuse to sell because I love the way they look, and they're worth about $100, and I got them at a flea market in New York for 10 so you just never know where things will come up. The carnival glass pieces I'm showing here, uh, they range depending on the pattern. Uh, for example, the piece on the right is Fenton's Dragon and Lotus. Dragon and Lotus is one of their most popular patterns. I'll pull in so you can see the dragon a little better. The lotus flower is every other panel, and then you see there's the dragon. Now, the thing is, is that this is a very popular pattern, but this is the marigold color, and marigold, you can see, the orange is one of the more common colors. So this piece is uh, priced at 75. And then next to it, we have Northwood's Grape and Cable. Usually those price in a similar um, price range as well, but the purple colors are a little, little more desirable than the oranges. There are some very rare colors in Carnival Glass. Green is somewhat hard to find, but you'll also see ice blue and red, and those can be very valuable if they're the original from the early 1900s. We'll pass by some Royal Dalton ladies. This is a category that has become very inexpensive to collect. They're hand-painted, they're very well made, they're all very well marked and detailed, and they're very sweet but they made a lot of them in their time. And so nowadays we can find them in a show like this for around $35 to $40. They used to sell for double that. These pieces are Fenton. This is the Burmese color. Burmese is one of the more desirable Fenton pieces. And you can see this one even has its tag saying Burmese. And on the back or in here somewhere, I'll bet we'll see that it says Fenton Glass. Fenton Glass is out of West Virginia. They are now out of business, but um, these pieces were made in the late 1970s. There's the Fenton card. And it was very difficult. Uh, the original Burmese was made in Victorian times, and it was a formula that was lost for a long time, and Fenton found a way to remake it. They also found out that as pretty as they were and as desirable as they were to people, the chemicals they had to use to make it turned out to be really bad for the kilns. And so they made it for about 18 months and it basically destroyed the equipment and they refused to make any more. Because of it, it's hard to find and it's desirable. The hat with the hand painting is priced at 89. This little piece is 45. Um, the basket, I didn't see the tag, but I think it's going to be somewhere in that range. And that's 89 again. And those are pretty typical pieces for those items uh, because they are scarcer and harder to find. I seem to always find jewel tea when I come to Indiana. And here's a nice display of it. 1930s, made by Hall China. Uh, they made it through the 1960s or 70s, actually. It was very popular, and it was sold through the um, Hall. Um, Hall sold it through Osco Drug and the Jewel Tea Company, and so that's why it's called Jewel Tea. Its real name is Autumn Leaf, appropriate for this time of year. And then we see some nice depression glass uh, pieces. Depression glass is another area that has come down in price, so if you like it, it's a really good thing to collect now. And then we're coming into Halloween, so we got to show you these old plastic guys. I know you look and think, well, gee, these aren't that different from what they sell now, but there actually are some differences, and these and the big blow molds are selling for big money um, compared to what they used to go for. We used to see these at swap meets for a few dollars each, and now we see the big uh, lamps and things sometimes selling for 50 and 100, so it's really changed. They also have this really groovy Christmas tree from the 1960s in the foil. That's pretty cool. And they've got a bunch of fall color Tupperware and things to match. Money. Funnily enough, Tupperware was not that inexpensive when it was new. It was sold at home parties, and you actually paid pretty good money for it. So uh, we are finding that the pieces that are marked Made in USA, and particularly if they say Orlando, Florida, where they were originally manufactured, those go for pretty good money now. 
coming over here, quilts are something we see in this part of the country. I personally love quilts. This patchwork from the 1930s, you can tell it's 30s because it's got the narrow band here. They didn't do the heavier bands until later, typically. Um, this one's been marked down to 60. It looks like it's a very attractive piece and that seems like a good price. This one's nice here because it's got, it's a signature piece. This one's several hundred dollars, but that's because it is a, it was done for somebody and everybody who sewed a panel in 1912 put their name and initial and the date on it. And then there's a really good quilt in the back. This looks like a Victorian era piece. The colors are strong. It's a very unusual pattern. This came from New York actually. And this particular one is priced at $4.25 because it's a very, very rare pattern. The red colors are hard to find in this era in good shape and not faded. Uh, so that's a really special piece, something that if you're a quilt person, that would be something you wouldn't expect to see often. Vintage kitchenware, very popular here. And we see a whole bunch of enamelware. Blue enamelware is a little more valuable than gray. We see these time to time because they did make a lot of them. Diamond dice was very popular in its time, which was over 100 years ago. And they did beautiful lithography because this is how they got people to look in the case to buy dye. So they would put a lovely scene of people having fun. This girl here has a brownie camera that she's holding. This girl here has a parasol and a big bow and you can see they're all sporting out on the lawn and the idea is that mom gets to go and play because she used diamond dye and so everyone looks great and she doesn't have to work so hard. In here we're going to see a lot of blue and white ceramic. A lot of this was made here in Indiana. Um, on the right you have a fish scale and wild rose. That's a pattern we don't see often in a more um, stylish shape. Usually things are pretty straight-sided. This piece here is the picture with the children is priced around $100, also a hard piece to find. And so coffee grinders, these are going to be from the early 1900s and we see a lot of people who drink espresso these days. I sell these out in Seattle in the summertime when I'm there very readily. We see a lot of interest in primitive kitchenware, even just basic pieces that people carved by hand and were free, essentially new, can sell for $15 and $20 now just because they have a look. Another thing that really attracts people these days for the look are crocs. And when you get these older ones, these are usually before 1900 when they had these interesting designs. This is done using a blue clay slip to decorate. Four means how many gallons it is. And then the designs that they would use, like this is called bee sting because it vaguely looks like a bee. This one I believe is uh, some people call tornado that's on the jug there. Um, so those are earlier pieces. Later we see obviously ink stamped, more manufactured looking stamps from the early 1900s like this Monmouth piece. And the values really change when you get into the 1900s. The two on the right are in the 150 to 200 range. The one on the left is uh, well under $100. Vintage Christmas, of course, is coming out because we're near the season. Rubber face Santas are another thing that younger people are really interested in because they remember these growing up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. This one's priced at 28, which is a pretty good deal. I have a hunch I will come back for him. We also see some cool old uh, stockings. This looks like something that my uh, folks had when they were first married. Way back. These are enamel pieces, and these are Scandinavian. I imagine David Anderson and some of the other designers, a lot of these pieces are signed. They're 1950s. They're enameled on sterling, typically. Very desirable in the marketplace, have been for a while. Very collectible now, and can be rather pricey. This dealer actually has a lot of jewelry. They even have it under the table, so we'll have to come back and spend some time here. These pieces are newer that I'm going to show you now, but they're interesting. They are uh, various makers. Leah Stein is known for doing this sort of work in Lucite. They're multi-layered. They're expensive to do because of the stacked, and they are a future collectible. So if you see them in a jewelry box at a garage sale, grab them. Lots more uh, Navajo jewelry, and then we see a whole lot of costume back there. 
This sterling piece is Peruvian, sterling mounts, something that uh, we don't see very often. And then we have a collection of cruets. Cruets are something that a lot of people collect, and I wanted to point this one out because it's bluebirds. And typically when you see bluebird china, you're looking at something from the 19-teens or 20s. And this particular one is marked in a way that I hope you can see. Hey, it's Limoges, very good. So that's French, and that's surprising because most of the bluebird pieces were made in this country. I can tell you in a general range as far as the pieces that we're looking at here on cruets. Clear pattern glass can go for as little as eight or nine dollars. Art glass can be up in the 30s and 40s. Biscuit jars are another category that they have in abundance. It's kind of fun to show groupings of things because then you get an idea of the width and breadth. Um, these were made in England. Biscuits, of course, to them are what we call cookies. It's what they serve with tea. The one I'd like to point out in the back here, this is another wave crest. I showed you a wave crest piece pre previously, and that is their biscuit jar version, I believe. Somebody uh, overheard us and gave us a slip, so here's when these take place. So the next one will be January of 2020, and then they, that's the winter show in the two heated buildings, and then the other three shows have antique and flea market dealers, and they spread throughout this entire complex through seven buildings. We're in farm country, and boy, here are a lot of farm collectibles. We've got various presses for everything from cider to meat and a whole lot of old juicers. A lot of people are really interested in things that have early patent dates on them. So the slicer here is dated 1863, and that seems to be what people are really interested in, are the old embossing. That's a lot of the appeal of these old pieces. And depending on the maker and the style, they can be very pricey. They go anywhere from 40 or $50 on up, but I've seen them sell as much as two and 300 because certain ones were a very short patent or didn't last for very long in the marketplace. Juicers, another area of popularity. Malt mixers and milkshake machines, people love them because they're indestructible and almost all of them still run. And so a lot of people like to have one around the house because you can make yourself a pretty good smoothie or shake with those. And speaking of ice cream, ice cream scoops. A lot of people don't realize this stuff is collectible, but it really is, uh, and there's a lot of different variations. Somebody asked me a good question considering that I travel all over the place. Where's the best place to go to buy antiques? Is it Florida? Is it the Midwest? Um, I have to say it really depends on what you collect. If you like mid-century pieces from the 20th century, for example, you may do as well in, surprisingly enough, Florida or California or parts of Washington State and Oregon as you will anywhere else because that's when those places were developing. On the other hand, if you are looking for Victoriana or farm primitives or that sort of thing, the Midwest is still a great place to go for that. And for kitchenware, look at these uh, cute watering can girls. This is a spice set from about 1940. I have not seen this particular one before, and I've seen a lot of kitchen glass over the years. We see these patterns here a lot more frequently, so I can understand why they've got 165 on the set of six. These other uh, sets are in the 50 to $60 range for the three pieces, which is actually pretty reasonable. So again, this is a good part of the country to find this sort of thing. I think the real answer is there's almost always something interesting anywhere you go. And so it has more to do, if you're looking for something that was made somewhere and you're looking for things from that area, the place that you'll pay the most is in the area they were made. So for example, if I'm looking for Blue Ridge, China, I don't go to Tennessee for it because that's where it sells for the most. Here's some really cool Stacking Lawyers bookcases. We've got one in mahogany, one in oak. These are Globe Wernicke from about 1910. These sell typically for about $100 to $150 per stack and sometimes up from there, but these are priced less because, again, in this part of the country, this type of furniture is more available. So if you're looking for this sort of thing, Indiana and Kentucky and Midwestern places are good places to go for that. Here is a kitchen queen around these parts known as a Hoosier. 
These were cabinetry in kitchens before kitchens had built-in cupboards, and they're really very useful, especially if you have an older home without enough counter space or cupboard space. It's not a big piece of furniture, and it actually can hold a ton. They usually roll up and have uh, grinders or lifters or that sort of thing inside, and so you'll have a flour sifter and that kind of thing. Um, these old cabinets, also very popular in this part of the country, and a lot of people who are looking for this look, this is where they come because you can still find it. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!